Hello and welcome to a video lesson on diffraction gratings. The aim of this video is to discuss ideas about diffraction and things we should expect when we set out to do an experiment with it in a lab. My name is Baibo. We start off by making an attempt at understanding what diffraction is. It is defined as the bending of waves of all kinds when faced with an obstacle. This obstacle may be a dielectric material, a rigid wall, or an extremely well detailed aperture like a grating. This behavior of wave is counterintuitive to what we learn about light traveling in straight lines. Since we know all matter that has energy and carries certain momentum has a dual behavior, it propagates like a wave but exchanges energy like particles. The phenomenon of diffraction is native to all the waves. This animation is a FDTD, also called the finite difference time domain simulation of a plane wave incident on a circular dielectric. We can see that the parts of the wavefront are getting delayed after hitting the obstacle. This is because the wave travels slower within the obstacle. The smearing out at the bottom of the neat line pattern is caused due to diffraction. Here's a simulation that develops some intuition about diffraction. We have a lot of parameters on the right to tweak. We can change the frequency of the incident wave. We can change its amplitude. Or we can do the same experiment with water waves or sound waves. On the left we have a light source that emits plane waves. We can adjust the position of the slit and the size of the slit. Now for the purpose of this demonstration we'll keep the slit to the extreme left so that we can see the wave fronts coming out of the slit evolving for more time. So we switch on the light. We can see that adjacent to the slit the wave fronts have a definite non-zero curvature and as we move away from the slit, they are flattening out or the curvature is getting to zero. Close to the slits, we are in what is called the Fresnel's regime, whereas some distance away, the Fraunhofer's approximations are valid. On the right, we can place a screen that will show us the diffraction pattern. There is another simulation available at the same link as the previous one. This setup mimics diffraction for a laser. We're using a green laser only for the purpose of our video here and this can be done with any color that you please. The setup has a laser light which falls on a small aperture, circular in this case. We can change the shape of the aperture as well. Beyond this aperture we can see a screen which will show us the diffraction pattern. The upfront views of the aperture and the screen are shown on the large black squares. We see that the wavelength is about 500 nanometers and we know that diffraction effects are most pronounced when the aperture and the wavelengths are comparable. The diameter of this aperture is 0.1 mm which is pretty small but still not comparable to the wavelength. We switch on the laser. Now what we see on the right is what is known as an airy pattern and is essentially a far field image of the diffraction. Now we make the aperture even smaller. We can see that as we make the aperture small, the central spot or the central maxima is getting bigger. Let's do it again. See, as we reduce the length of the aperture, the central spot gets bigger. Therefore, we conclude that the width of the central zero order maxima in case of diffraction is inversely proportional to the width of the aperture. This is yet another FDTD animation of a plane wave incident on a periodic structure. The plane wave has a wave vector k and is incident from the top. A very important observation is to be made. The incident wave assumes the same period as that of the host or the structure. It doesn't take on the same shape. It takes on the same period. We can see that the period of the structure is shown on the above as lambda sub x. The wave after it encounters this structure assumes the same period lambda sub x that is shown at the bottom. 
This is precisely the reason why diffraction is used to probe the structural properties of crystals as the diffraction pattern reveals information about the periodic properties of the crystals. The form of a diffraction equation is used to model the diffraction of waves when the diffraction pattern is viewed at a long distance from the diffracting object. This model of diffraction is also called the far field analysis due to obvious reasons. The configuration and the minutes of the setup are shown in this picture. The screen where we want to see the diffraction pattern is placed many wavelengths away from the slip and hence the term far field. As we've mentioned already, the wavefronts become more planar as they evolve and move away from the slip. The final diffraction occurs when either the distance from the source to the obstruction or the distance from the obstruction to the screen is comparable to the size of the obstruction. These comparable distances and sizes lead to unique diffractive behaviors. As we've seen already in the previous animations that the slit or the aperture emits a wavefront which evolves with space and time. The exact moment when it is emitted, the wavefront has some curvature that eventually goes to zero in the power field. But it is a more general form since the results of the Fraunhofer diffractions can be obtained using this analysis under some limiting conditions. This is an animation that compares the three different mathematical models that explain diffraction. The parameter z denotes the distance from the aperture where diffraction is taking place. We've talked about Fennel's model and Fraunhofer's model. The rayleigh sommerfeld model of diffraction is also called the scalar model of diffraction, but we will not talk about it here. The z parameter is increased gradually. The colorful shapes that we see actually show the diffraction pattern that we expect to see on a screen z distance away from the slit. We see that when the size of the wavelength is comparable to the distance z, all the three models predict different patterns. The rayleigh sommerfeld model and the Fresnel model are somewhat similar when the distance z is about four times that of the wavelength lambda. As already mentioned, the Fraunhofer's model is a far field approach. And we can verify it here at about z equal 9 times lambda. We're entering the regime called the far field and all the three models begin to overlap. You can see right about now. Let's get into some practical stuff. What exactly are we trying to do? In spectroscopy, we're interested in finding out the spectral properties of a source that may be an atom or a giant star situated many light years away. The idea is to make the light from the source of interest fall on a grating placed here and then study the diffracted pattern to understand the composition of the source. In the lab, this is done by placing a light source like a sodium lamp or a laser light on the right. The collimated light falls on the grating and we can see the diffraction pattern from the telescope on the left. We then use our theoretical understanding of spectral lines and previously known data to find information about the light source that we're using. This beautiful image shows the diffraction grading at work. This is the diffraction grading. It is being shown by a light that is made up of different frequency or wavelength components. We can see that the grating has separated the wavelengths, causing a colorful spectrum to be seen on both sides of the central bright. This bright rectangular image is what we call the central maxima or the zeroth order. The spatial separation of the constituent wavelengths is seen on both sides of it. These bunches are what we call the fraction orders. These are what we call the first orders. It is interesting to note that the orders are discrete, meaning that there isn't a continuous band of colors on the screen and there are periods of light and darkness. What exactly is a grading? In literal terms, a grading refers to a regularly spaced assembly of identical elements or grooves or apertures. A diffraction grading has these periodic elements called slits. In order to see diffraction effects prominently, the linear dimensions of the slit 
need to be of the order of the wavelength of light that we're dealing with. There are two major types of diffraction gratings that can be found in most of the labs. A transmission grating, in which the incident and the diffracted rays lie on the opposite sides of the grating. And second is a reflection grating, in which the incident and the diffracted rays lie on the same side of the grating. A reflection grating is basically a transmission grating, followed by a reflecting surface. The exact solutions of the diffraction integrals may be daunting, but it is fairly straightforward to find the positions of maximum intensities of the diffraction pattern on a screen using elementary geometry. These are the grating normals. Now if the incident beam falls parallel to it, the grating equation looks like this. To add a little more complexity to the equation, we let the wave be incident on the grating making an angle theta sub i with the normal in which case the grading equation has a form similar to this. The plus minus sign between the two sinusoidal terms is a matter of convention of measuring angles relative to the normal. If the angles are being measured counterclockwise, it is assumed positive and negative if the angles are being measured clockwise. Let's pause and explore the grading equation for a while. Lambda is the wavelength under consideration. M is what we call the spectral order or simply the diffraction order. Theta sub m is the angle at which we are observing the diffraction maxima. Theta sub i is the angle at which the incident plane wave meets the grading relative to the grading normal and d is the spacing between two adjacent grooves. The grading equation reveals some important points. For a particular set of values of the groove spacing d and the angles theta i and theta m, the grading equation is satisfied by more than one wavelength. In fact, there may be several discrete wavelengths which when multiplied by successive integers m satisfy the conditions for constructive interference. The physical significance of this is that the constructive reinforcement of wavelets refracted by successive grooves merely requires that each ray be retarded or advanced in phase with every other. This phase difference must therefore correspond to a real distance, which equals an integral multiple of the wavelength. The spectral order m can take on integer values, which tells us why we can see the diffraction pattern on both sides of the central right. Lastly, only those spectral orders for which the absolute value of m lambda by d is less than 2 can exist. If this is not the case, sine of theta i plus sine of theta m would exceed 2, which is physically meaningless. This restriction prevents light of wavelength lambda from being diffracted in more than a finite number of orders. This is a virtual lab setup that can be accessed on the web. The circle here shows what we would see looking into the telescope in an actual setting. We are just the focus to get a sharp image of the object, which is, in this case, a leaf. Proceeding further, we can see a page where we can get a feel of what to expect in a real environment. Before anything else, we switch on the light. I should warn you, the simulation isn't very accurate regarding the exact values of angles but gives you a fair enough idea of the related experiment. We have a bunch of parameters that we can play with. Let's place the diffraction grading. Here's the grading. We now change the angle of the telescope relative to the grading and we should see the diffraction pattern on both the sides. We're starting to see a pattern and a little more. Here we have it. You can see different colors in the telescope while the light being shown was white in color. Now we move to the opposite side and we expect to see a spectrum like this. 
Oh, we do. We asked ourselves a question about what a diffraction pattern in discrete in nature and there are no continuous colors in it and there are regions of darkness and light. The reason can be understood as follows. Since light is an electromagnetic wave and is made up of things called fields, it is due to the very defining properties of a field that we only see discrete orders. A field as we know is a continuous entity. Since we've seen how the incident wave takes on the same period as that of the host, we use these lines, these, these fine lines, to indicate the chopped wave fronts. Now in order to see any observable pattern on a screen, these individual fields need to interfere accordingly. If we change the angle of each section by equal amounts, we see that in the second picture, these fields from various slits are in continuous at the dotted lines and are not interfering constructively. We wouldn't see a diffraction pattern in this case. The third picture is what we call the spectral order 1. Since all the sections have been rotated by equal angles and have come into a position where there is a continuous pattern visible, this would create a sustained pattern on the screen. Therefore, we make a crucial observation. The field must be continuous, so only discrete directions are allowed. These allowed directions are called diffraction orders, and these are calculated using the grading equation. Another consequence of the grading equation is that we observe overlapping of spectral orders of different wavelengths. In this picture, a polychromatic light strikes the grating from the right and is diffracted. The grating equation tells us that the light for the wavelengths 100, 200 and 300 nanometers in the second order are diffracted in the same direction as the light for the wavelength 200, 400 and 600 nanometers in the first order. Since the light is incident from the right and any angle measurements would be done relative to the grating normal, the angle of incidence in this case would be less than zero and we should expect a negative value for the spectral order M. Originally, high resolution gratings were ruled by high quality rolling engines whose construction was a large undertaking. A man named Henry Joseph Grayson designed the machine to make diffraction gratings, succeeding with one making about a hundred thousand lines to an inch. This was in the year 1899. The latest rule gratings can make up to 10,000 lines per millimeter. Later, photolithographic techniques created gratings from a holographic interference pattern. Holographic gratings have sinusoidal grooves and may not be as efficient as rule gratings. Many diffraction gratings use a photosensitive gel between two substrates. A holographic interference pattern exposes the gel which is later developed. These gratings are called volume phase holographic diffraction gratings or simply VPH gratings. These have no physical groups but instead a periodic modulation of the refractive index within the gel. This removes much of the surface scattering effects typically seen in other types of gratings. VPH diffraction gratings are not destroyed by accidental touches and are more scratch resistant. When light from a point source passes through a small circular aperture, it doesn't produce a bright dot as an image, but rather a diffuse circular disk called the Aries disk, surrounded by much fainter circles. This example of diffraction is of great importance because the eyes and many optical instruments have circular apertures. If this smearing of the image of the point source is larger than the aberrations produced by the system, the imaging process is said to be diffraction limited, and that is the best that can be done with that size of the aperture. This limitation on the resolution of the images is quantified in terms of the Rayleigh criterion, so that the limiting resolution of a system can be calculated. 
if all parts of an imaging system are considered to be perfect, then the resolution of any imaging process will be limited by diffraction. Let's talk about something very exciting, a rhythm. As the name suggests, it's a compound optical element that is made up of a grating and one or more prism. This assembly acts as a dispersive element by exploiting both the properties of a grating and a prism. We know that a grating deflects the color red more than the violet, but a prism does the exact opposite. It deflects the violet more. Due to a combination of these behaviors, these setups achieve beam dispersion without deviations and are used in very powerful imaging systems. A grism reduces aberration and gives much more control over optical designs. We conclude the discussion by going through some important points to take home. Diffraction is native to all the waves and is defined as the bending of light around the edges. The Fresnel model of diffraction is a more general model and is used to study diffraction behaviors in the neo-field regimes, whereas the Fraunhofer model solves the problem in a far-field scenario. In the far-field limit, the diffraction pattern replicates the shape of the aperture and the two can be related using Fourier transformations. At all times, the wave mimics the period of any structure that it passes through. The grating is a dispersive element that modulates the incoming light and spreads the total incoming power into discrete different directions. That can be found out using the grating equation. The nature of diffraction depends on several factors. The wavelength of the light wave, the distance between the source, slit and the screen, the groove distance and the shape and size of the aperture. The following resources were used in making this video tutorial. That's all folks. Thanks for watching.